Bodhi is probably the only city of 8,000 inhabitants in the world which has no church. October 1879. In 1882, Bodhi finally got its church. Two of them, Catholic and Methodist. His family wrote to Reverend Warrington regarding their sons. I do not wonder that you tremble when you think of his surroundings, a sea of sin lashed by the tempests of lust and passion. Such dissipation as is indulged in here you have never read of in books. Let me give you a table of contents for last week's chapter in Bodhi. On Monday morning, a man was lynched for shooting another in cold blood. On Friday, two men grappled with each other and holding fast with left hands, poured shot into each other until one dropped dead. And the other has been expected to breathe his last each hour since. Fill that out with what you must know accompanies it. And you have one week in Bodhi. Bad shots or not, enough lead had been pumped by 1880 that many men had been killed. Law-abiding citizens wanted to know how the constable and deputies could let these things happen. The Daily Bodie Standard offered a prize to the first person, criminal or otherwise, who could catch an officer out at night patrolling Bodie streets. And of all the murders committed, no one had ever been convicted. Partly because witnesses were too drunk to remember and partly because a jury of 12 good men could somehow never be assembled. Talk of a vigilante committee known as the 601 surfaced. And on the morning of January the 14th, 1881, it all came to a head. One Joseph de Roche, angry at the husband of a woman he had been romantically involved with, shot and murdered him in cold blood at the corner of Main and Low Streets. Bodhi Free Press. Between 1.30 and 2 o'clock Monday morning, a long line of masked men were seen to file out of a side street into Bonanza Avenue. There must have been 200 of them. Amid loud cries of De Roche, bring him out and hurry up. Jailer Kurgan appeared and said, all right, boys, give me a little time. De Roche's head was bare, and as the bright rays of the moon glanced upon his face, there was a picture of horror visible. He was hurried up a back street to Fuller, the corner of green was turned, and a halt was made. In front of this place was a huge gallows frame. Move it over to the spot where the murder was committed, was the order. And a dozen men carried it to the corner of Main and Low Streets. De Roach was asked by the leader if he had anything to say. He replied, no, nothing. Pull him was the order, and in a twinkling, the body rose three feet from the ground. While the body was still hanging, a paper was pinned onto his breast bearing the following inscription. All others take warning. Let no one cut him down. Bodhi 601. The cardinal rule of mine operation states that exploration should always precede extraction. Excitement ran so high in 1879 that mining corporations had thrown caution to the wind. Stock capitalization was raised and the massive machinery of mining was hauled in at great expense. Only 
a few companies ever earned any money for their shareholders. By 1882, miners in the Lint shaft had reached 1,200 feet into the earth. The rich Fortuna ledge of gold had played out, and it was evident the Veta Madre didn't exist. The smaller mines outside Bodie Bluff and Standard Hill had been pure speculation right from the beginning. What had become inflated gems of corporate red ink began closing. The red cloud, the noonday, the oro. Stocks, once at $53 a share, plummeted to near worthless. Almost overnight, the collapse destroyed the magic of Bodie's name. Miners were laid off and Bodie slid into a deep depression from which it would never recover. Business people of Bodie got the message and many of them packed up and left for greener pastures. Now the stages that had been overloaded with newcomers were overloaded with the departing. And no one left faster than the bad men and easy women. By 1883, Bodie's North End was already a ghost town. In time, only two mines stayed in business, the Bodie and the Standard. In the summer of 1892, Bodie's worst nightmare became reality. A kitchen fire spread quickly engulfing 60 tender, dry, old buildings. By the turn of the century, only 500 people could call Bodie home. In 1917, the Bodie Railroad was sold for scrap and dismantled. Bodie edged closer to death as a mining town. The final nail was driven into Bodie's coffin in 1932 when toddler and part-time arsonist Bodie Bill got caught playing with matches behind the old sawdust saloon. The resulting conflagration almost destroyed the rest of town. Of the 1800 buildings that once populated Bodie, a few were saved. The structures that exist today passively resist the onslaught of time and weather, year in and year out. In the numbing quiet of the cemetery, silent tombstones speak epitaphs to the present generation telling of the harsh realities of mining camp life, of sacrifices made by the common man. Like the old dead skin of creatures gone on to better things, Bodie's buildings sit. Architectural remnants of distant dreams now dead. The hopes and fears of Bodie's pioneers may have long since passed away, but these remains testify to the collective efforts of past lives now evolved to present-day America. And though Bodie today may be like old discarded skin America has left behind, people the world over return to visit it in ever-increasing numbers. It is our heritage, part of the reason why we are what we are. For nowhere else in America can a person journey back in time so perfectly to a Wild West mining camp as in the true ghost town of Bodie.
all it takes is 